So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. Wisconsin Eye is interviewing state officials and leaders of industries affected by the COVID-19 health emergency. Pete Madlin is executive director of the Tavern League of Wisconsin. Pete, thanks so much for talking to Wisconsin Eye about the issues with your industry. Glad to be here. Well, let's go back over some, I know you had a Chitek Tavern before you became the executive director. You've weathered a few controversies, the drinking age, the smoking ban, and uh, proposals for tougher drunk driving laws. But let me ask you this, COVID-19, the worst impact on Wisconsin tavern history that you've seen? Uh, without a doubt, uh, everything pales uh, uh, in respect to COVID-19. We fought the, the drinking age, the .08 battle, uh, smoking ban, uh, everything has had an impact on our business, a negative impact, but uh, nothing that we've seen like this. Well, uh, what percentage of Wisconsin taverns are now closed, Pete? Theoretically, 100% are closed. Uh, some are open partially. Uh, they are allowed to do carryouts of, uh, of a beer and liquor in, in, in original, conceal, original seal containers. Yeah. Uh, restaurants can do carryout food. Uh, many of our many of our stat, standalone taverns, mom pop uh, joints, uh, the typical downtown tavern, uh, are, are not open because they don't have food license. And uh, to sit around waiting for someone to buy a six pack of beer just isn't feasible. Okay. So, what percentage of uh, tavern league members with a food license are trying to make it with curbside? Well, I think everyone that has a food license. <laughs> has realized that that is a chance to create some traffic. And so I'm guessing probably uh, 80 to 90% of those with food license are, are uh, attempting to do some to-go uh, food orders, yes. What's your advice to a Tavern League member with a food license when they say, Pete, should I try to do carry out and curbside? I, I, I recommend that yes, you should, but I'd keep it simple. Uh, don't try and do everything on your menu uh, keep a very, very limited menu so you can limit your staff, you can limit your inventory, and uh, do what you do well, but keep it simple. Okay. And what about this idea? They can, they, those with a, a, a restaurant license can serve food. Can they also bring out some type of alcohol as long as it's bottled or something? Talk about they, that. Sure. I'd be glad to. Uh, a lot of people are under the misconception that they can sell drinks to go. So if you want a fish fry, uh, give me an old fashioned in a plastic cup. That is not legal. Uh, we are not encouraging our members to do that. Uh, what our members can do, for instance, if they have a special uh, Bloody Mary recipe, they can sell a, a jar of their Bloody Mary mix without the alcohol. And then they can sell a, a mini, uh, you see those mini uh, airplane bottles of vodka, for instance, yep. or a bottle of vodka, as long as it's in the original sealed container, along with that, allowing the person to go home and make their Bloody Mary but uh, anything that is pre-mixed with alcohol in it uh, is not allowed. The uh, other thing that is doable are the growlers, the beer growlers that have been, become popular with the, uh, with the advent of the craft beer industry. So a lot of people uh, like to come in, they can fill their growlers up. Uh, the Department of Revenue has uh, deemed that legal, that that is considered a, an original seal container. So you can fill growlers with beer, you can't fill it with a Bloody Mary, but you can put beer in your growler and take that home also. I think the Tavern League about, what, five or six weeks ago floated the idea of letting uh, Tavern uh, League members with restaurant licenses actually serve mi mixed drinks, but that didn't get any traction? That didn't go anywhere, Pete? No, we uh, did not get any type of response from that. There are other states right now that are allowing that, but uh, we have not had any progress in that area. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the tavern industry in Wisconsin. What percentage of its incomes comes from alcohol? percentage from food, and I know video gaming has been growing. So just, can you talk about some statewide averages? Uh, I can talk statewide averages because everything is so individual. Uh, for instance, your supper clubs, your typical supper club, I would say is a 70 or 80% food to alcohol ratio. Okay. Uh, your local tavern that has a grill behind the bar, it's probably uh, the opposite, uh, a 70% uh, alcohol versus a 30% food. 
Uh, I know when I had my place in Chitek, I was running about a, a 30, 65 to 70 uh, percent alcohol ratio over the food. Of course, uh, it doesn't take a, a expert to understand that the real profit in our industry is in the alcohol end of the business. Uh, and that's why our people are in a tough position right now because the only thing they can really, really promote is the food end, and that is not the most profitable end of their business. Now, you and I have uh, been around the Capitol for a while. You've been in the industry for a long while. Has video gaming grown significantly as a source of revenue for taverns, Pete? I think video gaming is, uh, I think, uh, actually has been stabilized or declined. I think the uniqueness has worn off. Um, and uh, so I don't see that as a, a growing part of, uh, of our people's income. Okay. Now, um, the Tavern League has offered a, a specific plan that would let it reopen with some major conditions. And we're going to show those graphics and uh, a, a graphic summarizing your proposal. And so let's, let's go down these points one by one. All employees must wear masks and gloves. Why, Pete? Well, obviously, this is a part of the, a lot of these recommendations, uh, Steve, come from the CDC recommendations that were put out in March, and we are kind of copying a, a lot of those recommendations. And they do recommend a mask and gloves. Uh, we understand that gloves might be something that uh, uh, is won't be the uh, easiest for our members to adapt to. Uh, and that might be something that, that could be uh, even negotiated possibly, but the masks are definitely a, a, a thing that we're going to have to do to uh, uh, keep down the spread of the virus. So a bartender would have to wear the same mask for the entire shift and the same thing with the waitress? Uh, yes, I would say that maybe uh, changing in and out of a different mask on occasion, if it, maybe after a certain time of use, whatever. This will be up to the individual owners how they want to do that. Okay, and then uh, another uh, part of the proposal, maintain social distancing of six feet and tables six feet apart. Um, are you also following C CDC recommendations on that? Yes, we are, yes. Okay, tables would be limited to six people, but I just wanna be sure um, the tables, uh, the people at a table of six, they would not have to be six feet apart, correct? That is correct, a table of six. Typically these people know each other, uh, uh, they don't, they're not going to be putting each other's in harm's way or people around them. Uh, we, uh, we think six is a reasonable number. We don't want a situation where somebody comes in with 20 people and saying, hey, this is my family, and put the bar owner or the waitress or the bartender in a position to dispute them. Uh, uh, so we think six is a reasonable number for a family outing, a family group to get together. But if you want to have a family reunion, don't go into a licensed establishment. Okay, uh, let's go back to masks and gloves just uh, for this point. If I'm waiting for a table at a tavern under your proposal, would my wife and I both have to wear masks as we waited? Uh, no, uh, okay. I, I believe under our proposal, we are recommending that for employee for the employees. Okay, uh, back to your proposal. Reduce on-premise on -premise, excuse me, capacity by 50%. So if I had a tavern with 12 uh, seats at the bar and 60 seats in a, in a restaurant setting, would I have to cut it to six at the bar and 30 at in 30 restaurant seats, Pete? I think it'd be your prerogative as, as an owner. Uh, you know what, where the uh, people like to gather. I think that uh, a lot of people like to gather at a bar, so you may want to cut back your seating at the, uh, in the restaurant area, depending on time of day also. Uh, during the day, I think uh, your daytime flow might be more around the bar where evening traffic might be the opposite in your dining room. Uh, here again, I think the uh, individual uh, restaurant, tavern owner has to make those decisions, uh, whatever works best for them. Um, we do think that uh, as people strive to do this, the object here, Steve, is to make the customer comfortable, make them feel that they can come in uh, without worry of getting infected, enjoy themselves, enjoy a meal, have a drink, and, uh, and not have to worry about uh, taking a virus home with them. If part of your proposal is reducing the on-premise capacity by 50%, I've got to ask this. Won't, you be, won't, your tavern, uh, won't the members of the league be forced to raise their prices just to stay profitable? Um, well, first off, we, this is not an end-all. This is a stopgap measure. Okay. We understand that people cannot survive at 50% capacity, uh, keeping people six feet apart forever. That is not going to work. We need to create some traffic for our members. We need them to get that till ringing. That's the number one priority here. Uh, if our member feels that they have to raise their prices, so be it. 
uh, uh, that here again, that, that'll be a business decision. And, uh, but we need to get these doors open. We're going to have some people that are going to say, you know what, this doesn't work for me. There's no sense in me opening up if I have to uh, abide by these uh, standards. And that's their prerogative, and, and we'll respect that. But for those of that say, hey, you know what, having uh, eight or ten people in here is better than my doors being locked, it is an alternative for them. Another part of your proposal, outdoor eating and drinking, uh, only if six, six feet apart. Talk about that. So if I'm at, a, at an outdoor bar, would I have to be six – Drinking beer in an outdoor bar, would I have to be six feet away from the next customer? Uh, here again, I, I think under the ideal scenarios, that would be, that would be the case. Uh, obviously, if you walk in with your wife and you want to sit at the, uh, an outdoor bar, we would not expect you to be six feet apart. But there's two strangers. Yeah, we would encourage you to, to stay apart. If you walk in, there's one guy sitting at, at the bar, you don't know him. And uh, we would encourage you to sit six feet away. The outdoor thing, we have a lot of areas that uh, have outdoor seating. Some are not licensed, and we would like to have all of these unlicensed areas. I might have a, a driveway in the back of my bar. If I want to uh, uh, put some tables out there, allow me to do that. Uh, some communities might say, hey, if you want to put a table or two out in front of your place on our, our city sidewalk, we're going to be comfortable with that. So we'll allow the smaller taverns, give them an opportunity to increase their capacity uh, when we're on one hand reducing capacity by half, but hey, if you have an opportunity, you want to see some people outside, we have no problem with that, and we think that can be part of the solution. In the wake of the indoor smoking ban, a lot of your members uh, opened up outdoor seating, correct, Pete? That is correct. That was an option, uh, not for everybody, but for many of our members were able to do that, yes. Okay, another part of your proposal, no salad bar or self-serve buffets. Why? Well, this is the standard now. Uh, here again, this is the CDC. Uh, you go into a gas station now where you used to have your hot dogs on little roller things, make your own hot dog. You don't yep. see that. You can't pour yourself a, a soda anymore at, at, at a gas station. This falls in uh, those, those lines, and we don't have any problem with that. Okay. And the last part of your proposal, eliminate paper menus and condiments on the table. So if I want tartar sauce with my fish fry, how do I get it? Well, here again, uh, uh, this is a one-use thing, one use and throw away. Uh, yeah, I wish you would have used the example of ketchup or mustard, but as far okay. as tartar sauce goes, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of places have their own tartar sauce recipe, but I see the little one-ounce Dixie cups being used, put yeah. your tartar sauce in, and they're tossed away. We're getting away from the reusing of the same packages, same menus. Uh, use them once, get rid of them. Pete? Um, WMC has a plan to reopen in phases and regions. Milwaukee uh, Metropolitan Association of Commerce has a plan. Um, there was an interview yesterday with the head of the Restaurant Association. Um, is your proposal fit into any of these being offered by different groups, my friend? Well, I don't know if it does really. I think this is very, very specific to our industry. And I won't say that I'm real familiar with the proposals of uh, uh, of uh, the manufacturers or, or, or other groups, but we think that this is reasonable. A lot of uh, this is all within the guidelines of the CDC. And once again, I want to stress that this is not a, uh, an end solution. It is a stopgap. And uh, we feel it is a reasonable, uh, uh, a reasonable uh, expectations on our members. We need the public to feel comfortable going into a bar or into a restaurant, enjoying themselves, without having to go home with a fear, uh, did I get contaminated? And until we get that to that point, our places are going to sit empty. But this, this at least gives us an opportunity to prove to the public that we can do it. We have thousands of stores throughout Wisconsin now that are open serving thousands of people every day. And all we're saying is that we can do the same thing. And, uh, and given our, 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 uh, if, we give, if we are given a chance, we'll prove we can do the same thing. And those operators that don't want to operate under these guidelines, you know what? They're not going to have any business because people are going to be comfortable walking into those businesses. What percentage of members of the league are, you use the term ma and pa? I would say 90%, 90 percent uh, of our people, uh, if not more. Uh, we don't have the chains. We don't have the Applebee's or the Chili's. Uh, we have uh, several that are on three, four, five establishments. But 90, yeah, 90% 90 of our people are individual family-owned businesses. 
And uh, these are businesses that right now are really, really struggling just to keep their doors open. And, and that's who uh, we're trying to, uh, to help out here. What's at stake for those mom and pa owners of, of the typical Wisconsin Tavern? Are they faced with going out of business and not having anything in their later years? Exactly right. For these people, just like a any business owner, uh, I was in the business for 24 years. That was my business was my retirement. Everything that I invested, all my money, time and effort went into that building, into that business with the hopes that someday I could sell that business and have a nest egg to retire on. My members are seeing that nest egg depreciate every day. My members, some of them are already closing their business and they walk away with nothing. They have a building, maybe. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the devastating thing that people that ne have never been in business don't understand. They don't have a 401k. They don't have retirement programs. This is their retirement. And uh, they're, facing, they're facing the uh, uh, possibility of losing all of it. Some of them have worked for well, they, uh, their lifetime to try to build up something and they're seeing it uh, uh, threatened now. The regional part, the regional proposals to open by region, are your members north of Highway 10, north of 29, are they more um, interested in reopening? Do they have different issues than uh, taverns in the urban areas in southeast Wisconsin? Uh, definitely. Uh, my county, Barron County, where I live up in northwest Wisconsin, we don't have any cases of, of the virus. We had five cases. They were all quarantined and cured. We don't have one now. There are a, several counties that I've heard of that have zero cases of this, of this virus, and they're being treated the same way as they are in Milwaukee. We don't think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, if, if there is no threat or a very, very, very limited threat, we feel that these places should be able to open up and, and run their business uh, on, a normal, on a normal basis. Because to them, up north, everything is normal. They're not threatened. I understand that Milwaukee has some issues, Green Bay has issues, Madison has issues, uh, Chatech, Wisconsin doesn't. So we should be able to open up and, and run our businesses as we see fit. What percentage of annual profits, annual business, do uh, taverns north of 10 or 29 rely on the spring, summer, fall season, Pete? I would to say... Make, to, 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 to make it annually. To right, stay in yes. I can relate to that directly because my place was in a, a tourist area. And 70%, uh, uh, we have to make money in the summertime. We try to get by during the winter as best we can and pay our bills. But we have to build up our bank reserves during the summertime. If we have a bad summer... We have a bad year, no doubt about it. How do you feel about officials in some of these counties, Oneida and Vilas, saying, don't come here, don't come to your cottage, don't, don't visit here because we don't want you to bring COVID-19? Well, that's really unfortunate. We understand the safety issues of it. We really do. But uh, to, to, tell, to, to treat everybody like they have a disease, uh, we think is the wrong approach. Uh, uh, come on up north, do, you know, lead your normal life, but if you're going to come to our establishments, we're going to have certain, um, we're going to take measures to make sure that uh, uh, things are not uh, 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 going to endanger our customers. Hey, um, Pete, just, uh, I'm just curious. The, the governor's order had the effect of shutting down all non-essential businesses, including taverns, pretty much overnight. This is a minor question, but I'm really curious. What happened to all the beer that was on tap in taverns across the state when the switch got turned and the taverns had to close? Well, that's a good question. Beer has a shelf life. Uh, your liquor, your, your vodka, your brandy, your bourbons can sit on the shelf for a long, long time. Beer does not have that luxury. Uh, it is the law that, it, that uh, you cannot return beer or liquor to your distributor. Uh, and uh, it's called a consignment sale. Consignment sales are illegal in our industry. However, uh, we did get some legislation passed both on the federal level and the state level that says it's okay. So if the beer distributor wants to come in, they don't have to, but if they want to come in and take back their product, if the liquor distributor wants to come in and take back their product, they can now do so legally without getting uh, uh, penalized from the TTB or any state officials. Okay, just a couple more questions. Thanks for your time. The league has started what's called the Cheers program. What uh, is the Cheers program? 
The CHEERS program is that uh, we know that our people are going to see some devastating times here. And I think uh, what we did, we, we're starting the fund for anybody who wants to contribute. And this will uh, uh, gather money throughout this whole COVID uh, uh, experience that we're going through. And at the end of the, uh, at the, at the end of the day, at the end of this whole process, when we're back to open, opening up on a regular basis, uh, we'll, we're gonna have this pot of money that we will de divide up amongst all our members that uh, will help them uh, pay some of the bills that they are incurring now because they still have bills to pay. They don't have any income, but our people still have bills and, and we hope to be able to help them out a little bit with that. Was the federal paycheck protection program helpful, helpful for them? Have most of them applied? What are you hearing? Are they receiving money to pay the immediate bills? I, I'm hearing both. I hear a lot more from the people that are not getting responses. I know some people have benefited from the payroll protection plan. Uh, they're, they're happy with it. Uh, some have uh, applied too late, uh, ran out of time, uh, or they, I'm sorry, they ran out of money. Uh, we keep telling them to keep reapplying or keep applying, keep the pressure on, and hopefully some funding will come through. But there have been some that have benefited from it, but there's a lot of frustrated people also. I noticed from your website, Pete, that in 2019, the Tavern League of Wisconsin Foundation donated um, uh, $12 million to 15,000 charities. That's not going to happen this year, right? That uh, it's not going to happen in 2020. Uh, our foundation, that is our foundation and our members, our, all of our individual members, what they have done. Uh, so that is not uh, going to happen in 2020. Uh, our people are giving people. I, I'm sure if someone, if, if they have the ability to give to a cause, they're going to do it. But the ability to do that is being taken away through the, because of the uh, uh, closing of their businesses and uh, they're just not. Uh, able to to participate in in fundraising and things like they normally ha would do at this uh, every they do it every day or every week at their at different establishments. Uh, I've just done the numbers for uh, 2019 and we raised over 15 million dollars. Our members, okay. yes, I mean they're are, they're very very giving people, uh, and they want to help their communities, but they can only do so much. And right now, the it's, it's not a lot. I think it's important to know that the solution. Uh, uh, closing down till May 26th or April, whatever the date is, that that is not the solution because I think some people are saying we must remain closed until the virus is defeated, until it is cured. That is not going to happen until a vaccine is manufactured. And that's going to be a year, possibly two years, who knows how long, maybe never. So under those under that premise, some people are saying we may never open because we should not be open as long as this virus is out there somewhere. As long as one person has a virus, it's going to be an unsafe environment. We think that is very, very radical. Uh, we think that we can go ahead under the circumstances, under these circumstances, the current circumstances, we think we can open up and provide a safe environment, uh, just like thousands of businesses are doing. We don't understand why you can go to Walmart and buy it. I'm looking at the flower base behind you there. Why you can go buy flowers in Walmart, but you can't go to the local florist and buy one. Uh, why you can buy shoes at, uh, at one of the uh, big box stores, but you can't go to the local shoe store and buy a pair of shoes. We don't understand that concept. Uh, these small businesses can provide just as safe of an environment for the public as any other uh, that are already open now. Well, you've announced your proposals that uh, you say would allow the, the industry to reopen safely Three, two, three weeks ago. Uh, are you picking up any public support? Or are you disappointed at the public reaction? Uh, it, it's, it's hard to measure. Uh, we have not seen any polling uh, to that uh, effect. I get phone calls, emails every day. A uh, few are very, very, some of them are very, very supportive of us. Some of them not supportive of us. Um, we hope that, the, that uh, the public opinion will say, hey, wait a minute. You know, that makes some sense. Uh, why do I have to drive uh, 10 miles down the road to the big box store to, to buy something simple that my little local uh, uh, shop in town uh, can, can offer me? Uh, that doesn't make sense. I think the people, once they, they consider that, I think they would agree that uh, we're on the right track. Well, Pete, thanks for your time. Maybe one final question. What's at stake for your industry? If you don't get some relief, what does your industry look like on September 1, October 1, January 1? It is uh, bleak, uh, and that's putting it mildly. 
I think the best way to say it, Steve, is right now we've seen a trickle of businesses close up with the April closing. Uh, if, if this is extend to uh, May 26, uh, we're going to see a, a, a much larger flow of businesses closing. And if, if this goes much beyond May, um, our, uh, I'm sorry, May 26, if it goes much beyond that, we're going to see a tsunami of closings. Our people and any small business just cannot survive uh, not being open for this period of time. Taverns in Wisconsin have a long historical, color, colorful history, don't they? The main street of small biz, a small town, Wisconsin, is in jeopardy of changing forever. No doubt about that. Pete Madlin, Executive Director of the Tavern League of Wisconsin, thanks so much for talking about the concerns of your industry and the squeeze that it's under. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. You betcha. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.